So um, thank you officially for joining us for our first Knowledge in Motion lecture of 2017. Very excited to have you here and thank you to everyone who's also joining um, via the web. This is meant to be a, a lecture series that's available to people nationally and internationally as well as people here joining us today. So it's really exciting. Um, some quick introductions before we get started. My name is uh, Dr. Sherry Blauet. I'm a physiatrist here at Spalding and also um, co-director of dissemination and knowledge translation for our new um, spinal cord injury model systems, along with Bethlen Houlihan, who's um, here with me as well, um, and she'll say a few words in a minute. A couple of also introductions, I'd like to uh, quickly introduce and give thanks to our uh, project directors for the Spalding New England Regional Spinal Cord Injury uh, Center, that is Dr. Andy Taylor and Dr. Ross Safant, who's hiding in the back corner. Thank you, Ross. And also a quick shout out to um, the two people who were instrumental in organizing this tonight, and that is Arlone Cofield, if she could wave Arlone at registration, or where is she? Okay, well, She's making shout out to Arlone. And, uh, and Judy Zazula, who's over uh, still working the IT uh, over on the corner of the room. So many thanks to everyone who uh, made a great effort to make this possible this evening. Um, this this um, is our first Knowledge in Motion session, as mentioned. It also represents the first formal activity of our uh, merged Spalding New England Spinal Cord Injury Center, um, and we'll be continuing with activities all the way through 2021. We're really proud um, to be hosting this event. Um, and I'm going to turn it on to Bethlin. All right. So I'm just going to do a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about tonight and who we've got speaking. So um, first, tonight we're going to have Dr. Andy Taylor. He's going to be talking about um, the importance of exercise for cardiovascular health uh, after SCI. And then second, Dr. Sherry Blowett is going to talk about ex accessing exercise in the community after SCI. And you can see we have them up there um, for you to see. And then um, Dr. – oops, sorry. I'm so used to saying doctor now. Just everyone doctor, doctor, doctor. <laughs> Margaret Vasquez, am I saying it correctly? Okay. It's going to speak of the importance of nutrition in SCI. And last but certainly not least is Dr. Stan Ducharme. He's going to be speaking about enhancing sexuality after SCI. Um, so first let me just say to you that um, Dr. Andy Taylor, I'm going to tell you a little bit, he's Associate Chair for Research in the Department of Physical Medicine at Harvard Medical School, and he is the Director of the Cardiovascular Research Laboratory at Spalding Hospital in Cambridge. He holds a Master's Degree in Exercise Science and a Doctorate in Physiology. The major focus of his research is the human cardiovascular system and the exploration of the role of whole body aerobic exercise, including the paralyzed legs, to improve cardiovascular function and spinal cord injury. And as we noted, he is also co-PI of our Spalding New England Regional Spinal Cord Injury Merged Model System. So um, I'm going to introduce um, each person in turn. Does that make sense? And we can, yeah. So um, let's let Andy come over here, and we'll see if we can get his slides up for him. Hi, uh, I'm Andy Taylor. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to be talking today about um, the importance of exercise for cardiovascular health. And this may be of even more importance uh, to those with a spinal cord injury, simply because uh, spinal cord injury basically imposes a certain level of physical inactivity that's, that's unavoidable. Uh, unlike the able-bodied, um, those with the spinal cord injury are usually in a chair. They're not walking down the hallway, at least, whereas um, those of us who, who are not in a chair can at least get that form of exercise. Um, so as I uh, often do at the beginning of any talk about exercise, I like to throw this quote up. Uh, this is uh, Sir Joseph Barcroft, who is um, one of the uh, first physiologists to really explore the effects of exercise and basically define exercise physiology. Uh, and he said that the condition of exercise is not a mere variant of the condition of rest, it is the essence of the machine. So that is, our bodies did not evolve to sit, our bodies evolved to move and, and, and to exercise. Um, and uh, so that's sort of the, the take-home message here, that, that exercise is really the essence of, of, of health. Um, now, spinal cord injury has been um, called a, a, a form of premature aging. The long-term effects of spinal cord injury, in fact, do look like what we associate with normal human aging. Um, these changes in the heart and blood vessels, uh, 
There are changes in, in overall metabolism, changes in the muscles and bones, and all of these contribute to um, actually early development of cardiovascular disease in those with spinal cord injuries. Um, and, and the reason that uh, this looks like aging is, is uh, normal human aging, or what we think of as normal human aging, is because of the lack of physical activity. Um, physical activity is really one big part of why we see declines with age uh, from young to, to old age. And in fact, um, <clears throat> we can actually measure these declines and, and sort of know what the decline usually is with, with aging. So we won't worry about what these units mean, but just that an average um, normally physically uh, inactive or normally active 25-year-old would have a, an aerobic capacity or exercise capacity of about 50. Um, and by the time he's 65, uh, that's declined by 40%. So it's declining about 1% every single year or 10% every decade. Um, and a lot of that is simply because this individual is not exercising. Um, so he's matured and he's at the peak of his performance, uh, but then after that, uh, he does not exercise, and this is really just the accrual of time, 40 years of not exercising. Because if we look at an individual that we would term an elite master's athlete, uh, this is an individual who has continued to exercise throughout his life. He never stopped exercising. Uh, and we actually had this person in my lab and made this measurement. His value is, is 61. So he's a 63-year-old man, and he actually has an exercise capacity that's higher than a normal physically inactive 25-year-old. So that's in part because he exercises hard and frequently, um, but it's also uh, because he has exercised his entire life. And so um, we, in fact, see this if we look at um, a number of studies. So across a lot of studies, this is, uh, holds true. This is kind of a, a messy figure. Um, it's actually not mine, so I won't take responsibility for the messiness of it. Um, but this is a, a accumulation of data from numerous studies. Um, and, and the first point is if we just look at uh, untrained individuals, these two lines down here, you see this decline that occurs from age 25 to 65 and 75. And again, that's about 10% per decade. Um, it's worse if you're overweight, simply because there's less active um, metabolic tissue in the body. Um, and even if you're a young athlete, if you don't exercise, you're going to actually perhaps have even steeper declines in exercise capacity. Um, in contrast, if you look at this little blob up here of the master's athletes, these are individuals um, who have maintained their exercise regimen throughout their life. And um, they all are higher than their you know, older peers who don't exercise. And some of them can actually be equal to a, a young athlete who's very fit. Um, so how does this relate to uh, spinal cord injury? Um, uh, let me go back and say one thing. One key component uh, that we're appreciating now more and more of, of these individuals is not um, the frequency, never, no, uh, nonetheless, or, or necessarily the, the duration of exercise. It's the intensity of exercise. So over the past decade or so, we've come to appreciate that it's really intensive, intensity of exercise is what's going to define the, the beneficial adaptations. So speaking to that, um, and this is all pulled from papers that are published, so this is information that's out there. Um, in fact, uh, cancer deaths occur less frequently in those who run versus those who walk. So more intense exercise is associated with less uh, risk of cancer. Likewise, uh, respiratory disease. Uh, there's lesser incidence of respiratory disease with higher doses or intensities of exercise. Uh, high blood pressure, um, high cholesterol, high blood sugar, all of those occur uh, less often in those who exercise more intensely. And overall, in fact, um, death due to all causes is less in a direct relationship with more intense exercise. So intensity of exercise is really the key component. Certainly, you have to exercise more than once a month. Certainly, you have to exercise for more than five minutes or so. Um, so a certain level of frequency and duration is necessary, but intensity is the key component of this. So now turning to spinal cord injury and the issues with spinal cord injury and, and how exercise might help to mitigate some of these problems. Um, one thing that we do know is just one year after getting out of rehabilitation, um, on average, those with a spinal cord injury have an exercise capacity that's less than half that of the unfit general population. So if you take an individual who was an athlete prior to his injury, 
um, that really doesn't matter. Once uh, the injury has occurred and he's recovered from that and he's in a chair, he's going to have a very low exercise capacity. Um, and, and because of this, uh, it's, it's now uh, understood that rehabilitation needs to not just focus on maximizing independence, but we really have to look at maintenance of optimum health and fitness. And health and fitness go together. Uh, without fitness, you really can't be healthy. All right, so what happens after spinal cord injury in terms of the cardiovascular risk? Um, and all these things are sort of tied together. One thing that we see is, is these uh, protective high-density lipoproteins go down, and, and the harmful low-density cholesterol goes up. Um, so that alone is going to increase the risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, of course, because of the paralyzed muscle, we have loss of muscle mass, and that contributes to lower resting metabolic rate and increased blood sugar. Um, and another thing that we commonly see is increased body fat, and especially stomach fat. Um, that, that confers a large risk for cardiovascular disease. So if you just look at the, the figure here, this is a, an individual who doesn't have much abdominal fat, and he has a low risk. This individual has um, significant abdominal fat, but it's, it's beneath the skin. Um, so it's subcutaneous fat, whereas this individual has most of his fat is visceral fat or within the abdominal wall. So this individual is at the highest risk. And we see this quite frequently in spinal cord injury. Um, however, we do know that exercise can confer uh, benefits in terms of cardiovascular risk. So um, along the lines of intensity, moderate to high intensity, not low intensity exercise uh, improves fitness and will increase that good cholesterol, that HDL. Circuit training, which is a combination of both resistance or strength training with aerobic exercise can reduce overall cardiovascular risk by 25%. Um, both arm crank and circuit training can improve blood sugar. Hand cycling can reduce the stomach fat. And, and we know that those individuals who do uh, 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise every week, and this is recommended by the American College of Sports Medicine <coughs> and the World uh, Health Organization, those individuals have lower body fat than those who do not. So, so exercise can confer uh, these benefits to those with a spinal cord injury. One of the issues, however, that we find is that because of the loss of innervated muscle, getting high intensity exercise can be somewhat difficult. So as those injuries go up the spinal cord, there's less and less innervated muscle mass. So therefore, it's hard to get high intensity exercise. Um, and so what we've been employing in our lab is um, combining um, this, I think I have to click this, hang on. Uh, it's combining uh, functional electrical stimulation of the legs with um, voluntary exercise of, of the arms um, FES rowing. And um, we feel like this is probably for at least a certain population of those with spinal cord injury, maybe one of the best approaches to exercise. We're bringing in more muscle mass, both the um, paralyzed legs and, and, and the uh, innervated arms, to produce whole body exercise. And this was actually featured in an issue of New Mobility magazine a while back. And the point that I tried to make um, for the people reading this is that you know, this is not therapy, this is exercise. This is something you need for your entire life. And the meaningful exercise means you're going to sweat and you're going to breathe hard. Um, and some of this you, you may not get with the East End bike for sure. You may not get it even just with upper body arm crank exercise. Again, depending upon the level of injury. Um, and so we've actually put this out into rehab journals um, and, and published our results using this um, FES bike. And as I said, as that injury level goes up higher and higher, you have lesser and lesser uh, muscle mass that can exercise. And so therefore, exercise capacity is related to the level of injury. However, with the FES rowing, we actually can sort of go around the spinal cord injury and stimulate more muscle mass regardless of what your level of injury is. So then after the training, uh, in essence, uh, we were engaging more muscle mass. So therefore, exercise capacity did not relate to the level of injury any longer. Um, so I know I don't have much time, so I'm going to close with um, just to say yet again that exercise is indeed the essence of the machine, and when we engage the machine, we should seek to work as high intensity as we can. And I think I'll take questions later.
We're going to do questions at the end okay. because um, we want to make sure we get through everyone. So if you do have something, make sure to write it down. We don't want anyone to uh, forget, and we'll be very interactive at that point. Um, so I, uh, I'm going to move on to our next speaker in the interest of time. So next, we are going to have Dr. Sherry Blowett speak, and she is um, instructor in physical medicine and rehabilitation at Harvard Medical School. I'll move that out of your way. <laughs> and an attending physician at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. She serves as the Disability Access and Awareness Director for Spalding Network. Dr. Bloet is a former Paralympic athlete in the sport of wheelchair racing, competing for the U.S. team in three Paralympic Games. Translating her background as an athlete to the clinical setting, she is director of the Kelly Adaptive Sports Institute at Spalding Rehab Network. So um, I'll let you take over, Sherry. All right, excellent. Hopefully this, there we go. All right, good evening, everyone. So in terms of um, what I'm going to talk about this evening, we thought it would be a great idea to follow up Dr. Taylor's talk with a talk that was a little bit more uh, focused on how one actually finds opportunities for exercise in the community. So now we've learned about what our goal should be regarding trying to get that 150 minutes a week of exercise where you're actually breaking a sweat, have difficulty having an e easy conversation because you're breathing hard and you're really getting into it. But the question often becomes, after spinal cord injury, where do you find that opportunity? Um, FES rowing is one opportunity, um, and there are many others as well. And that's a little bit about what I'm going to talk about this evening. So we know it's important, but how do we find opportunities to engage, particularly after spinal cord injury? And we know through um, fairly good studies that there are community barriers out there that can be significant and can often hold people back or create challenges towards implementing an exercise program. Some of those, for example, are in accessible fitness facilities. So maybe you have a YMCA down the block from your place, but if it's not accessible in terms of the entry or the locker rooms or even having accessible options for fitness once you get there, then it's a far less useful tool than for other people, right? I think many have probably encountered that in the community. A lack of transportation can often be a challenge, especially for those who live in more rural areas where you might not have some of these resources right at your fingertips. Sometimes the costs can be a little bit challenging for people, even the most basic thing, uh, sometimes still is associated with, um, with, with a fee or with having to pay for that service. And, um, we know that, that the higher the cost of the program, the more difficult it is for people with SCI to engage. And then I think it's very important to focus on the fact that oftentimes when people with SCI go to exercise, sometimes there can be attitudinal barriers. Maybe the people at that facility might not be so friendly. And often in the community, uh, there isn't a lot of awareness about um, how to exercise after spinal cord injury or that people with SCI can exercise. And sometimes the attitudes that people encounter can be very disconcerting and, and discouraging towards continuing an exercise program. So this applies to everyone. I would say you know, any average Joe who's trying to get in shape often encounters challenges or barriers to exercise. But we know that after, after SCI, sometimes those can be uh, more complex and there's more factors at play. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own story. So I was injured and acquired a spinal cord injury when I was only about 16 months old. Um, and I grew up in a rural part of Iowa, actually. I'm a native Midwesterner. And as I was growing up and, and getting into elementary school and then junior high, of course, I noticed that a lot of the other kids around me were becoming involved in sports and exercise. And it looked fun. But I always thought it was something that just didn't really apply to me. Um, and for that reason, you can see some of the pictures here. Um, the top center picture is me at a piano recital. So I thought, well, I can play piano. That's a fairly easy thing to do that doesn't involve a lot of physical skill. Well, I guess fine motor skill, but not exercise-based skills. Um, I was in the debate club and on the student council. And I started to get involved in a lot of things that involved more sedentary activities. But I never thought that I could be an athlete. Um, then something changed, actually. I was in eighth grade, and one of our coaches at the high school asked if I wanted to try the sport of wheelchair racing. And at first, I blew him off because I said, well, it's a great idea, coach, but I'm not an athlete. That's not something I do. But he kept on me, and he kept asking me and bothering me about it until finally I went out for the team. And then slowly but surely, I learned about the sport of track and field and the sport of wheelchair racing, which ultimately provided many opportunities for me to both find fitness but also compete and make a ton of friends and become a part of the sports community. 
So I really didn't find exercise until I was in high school, which is a really, really delayed opportunity, right? Most kids get involved when they're much younger than that. So I understand that it can often be difficult to find these opportunities, and that's why I really wanted to, to talk about this today. So this is a figure that um, was, was put in a paper by uh, Jim Rimmer in uh, the PM&R journal. And I think it's really helpful because it shows that essentially, um, if you look at someone's health and function, which is on the uh, vertical axis, and then you look at their length after spinal cord injury on the horizontal axis, what you see is that after SCI, of course, one is typically in rehab for a period of time, and you gain strength and you gain function naturally as a part of the rehab process. The blue line is meant to indicate kind of a threshold of, of good fitness, so when people are finally starting to have some of the benefits that Dr. Taylor talked about. So when we look at what currently happens in rehab, we know that these days people often aren't enabled to stay in rehab as long as they used to be. So if we look at the blue line, we notice that now people sometimes are discharged before they have the opportunity to really reach that higher level of fitness because of just some of the limitations of our healthcare environment. If they are in rehab longer and they can get past or above that blue line, that's great. But then oftentimes people go home and without that constant source of support or ongoing rehab, people start to become more sedentary and lose the fitness that they gained in their initial rehab course. This can happen right after discharge or even after outpatient therapy, you know, once you've spent a period of time in the hospital and then go home. So really what we want to see is that people can engage in what this green line at the top, and that is using exercise and physical activity to get above that plateau and actually continue to gain fitness even after rehab is done. And that's, that's what we're really talking about tonight and empowering people to be able to do that in their own lives. My three key points for today, nobody ever re remembers more than three points after a talk. So these are the three points that I want you to keep in mind. And that is that everyone can be and needs to be their own advocate when it comes to accessing fitness. Number two, if at first you're not successful, don't give up, try again. And number three, find opportunities for exercise everywhere you go. You don't have to necessarily go to a gym. It can happen in your home. Exercise can happen everywhere if you're thinking about it. So we know that opportunities for exercise are pretty diverse. If you look at the general population, people exercise in lots of different ways. Sometimes they join a club team or go to the gym or do videos at home or have a treadmill in their basement or even just walk park far away from uh, the office and walk across the parking lot every day to get exercise. So we know that, that there are diverse ways to access this, and that's important to understand. And the bottom line is that you think about what works for you, what's realistic, feasible. Um, you know, most people don't have the goal of someday being a Paralympian or are competing internationally. Really, it's all about what's feasible and reasonable for you and what's going to work in your life and most importantly be fun, because if it's fun and something you enjoy, then we know, if we look at studies that look at motivation for exercise, we know that you'll end up doing it longer and incorporate it as part of your habits and routine. So the first point is be your own advocate. And I bring this up. I think this is one of the most important things to keep in mind. When people with SCI go out to try to access exercise, you're going to encounter a lot of other people who have never seen a person with a disability exercise at all. And so sometimes people can be a little skeptical or they might have concerns about your safety or they might say, oh, well, sorry, we just don't, we don't have opportunities for you. You should go somewhere else. And when that's the case, everybody needs to be their own advocate, and they need to be able to say, you know, I have a right to work out here and exercise here just like everybody else who walks in the door or wheels in the door. And therefore, um, standing up for yourself in a way is really important. Educating others and raising awareness is also key. As you go out and try to access exercise, other people are also learning from you, which is really important. It paves the way for other folks who might come down the road later. One example is, is um, thinking about gyms. A lot of gyms have spin class, right? You, you know, you look at the schedule, you see these spin classes, you might see a, a, a gym where there's like 20 bikes there, and, and people without a disability have that opportunity to do a spin class. Well, there's actually a um, piece of equipment called the crank cycle that's essentially just like a spin bike, but meant for your upper body. And the great thing about it is that it's been designed so that there's a seat here but the seat can either remain there or you can take it out completely and just use a wheelchair and wheel up to the piece of equipment. Or if you're a person maybe with an incomplete injury and you want to exercise but you don't have great balance, you can use that seat just to balance. Well, then you crank with your upper body. 
Um, I saw a gym once where they actually had a, a room for spin class and a room for crank class. And the beauty of it is that a person with a disability can sign up for crank class, but so can anyone. In being your own advocate, maybe you should go to the YMCA. You'll say, hey, have you ever, guys ever thought about having a crank class? But first, you don't succeed, don't give up. You have to try again. So this figure is meant to represent, you know, all of us have different preferences, and we shouldn't try to put a that you look forward to when you get up in the morning and that you know is going to keep you involved. And point three is find opportunities for exercise everywhere. So when it comes to maintaining fitness, every little bit counts. That ideal is that 150 minutes of exercise per week, but 50 is better than zero. 50 minutes is better than zero, and 100 minutes is better than 50 minutes. So wherever you can fit it in is really important to take advantage of that opportunity. One example I like to point to is something called the burn machine. It's essentially this piece of equipment that you can take with you. You can make, take it with you, put it in your suitcase when you travel. You can have it in the back of your car. And essentially, it's a, a piece of handheld equipment. And you could also, I'm sure, adapt it if you have reduced grip. And essentially, it has a bit of weight to it. And you just hold it in front of you and spin it like this. Or you can put it in different planes and spin it. And I tried it. It definitely gets your heart rate, gets your heart rate up and makes you break a sweat. It's something you can have in your office or at home or anywhere you go. And then I put a picture of a park here just to represent. We know that just propelling your wheelchair is not probably the best form of cardiovascular exercise, but it's certainly better than nothing. So if you have the opportunity to get out in the community, definitely take that opportunity. Here are some resources to consider, um, just some great websites. Uh, the National Center on Health, Physical Activity, and Disability has great even um, web-based like fitness videos. You can just pull up that website. Pick one that you enjoy and do it at home, um, for example. The Peter Harrison Center is, is located in the UK. Um, I put this up here in case there are folks um, on the webcast from our international audience. It also has a lot of resources uh, for exercise opportunities in the community. YMCA is probably the, the community-based gym or fitness facility that has the most access opportunities. And there are several here around Boston that actually have uh, specific programs for people with disabilities. Um, and you can go and work with an inclusive fitness trainer that has experience and knowledge of how to create a fitness program for someone with a disability. And this website for the Paralympic Sports Clubs is really useful. Again, not everybody needs or even wants to be a Paralympian, but it's just a great resource of different adaptive sports programs in communities around the country. So you can go to that website, put in the state or zip code, and it'll pull up opportunities that are, that are local to you um, wherever you live. So remember the three key points, important to be your own advocate. Um, if at first you don't succeed, make sure you try again, because eventually you'll find something that you love. And keep finding those opportunities to exercise everywhere. And this will be one of the best things you can do to preserve your health. If you think about all the things that happen after STI, you know, it can be a little bit overwhelming. You have to figure out your bowel and bladder program, figure out um, how to, you know, be a parent or a family member, figure out how to socialize in this community. Thinking about how you're going to optimize your opportunities for exercise is one of the best things you can do for yourself, um, and just as important as all those other factors, so something not to neglect. Um, so thank you. That's it. I think we'll move on to our next speaker and take questions at the end. OK, here we go. So. Um, Next up, we are going to have Ms. Margaret Loper Vasquez, and she is talking about the importance of nutrition in SCI. And she is the Director of Nutrition and Food Services at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. Uh, she received her master's degree from Boston University in human nutrition. Ms. Ms. Vasquez, uh, Ves I did it wrong again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I got to practice this at home beforehand. Ms. Vasquez completed her internship as employed at Boston Medical Center for three years. She was school nutritionist, nutritionist at Perkins School for the Blind for 10 years. In 2012, Ms. Vasquez became to SRH as clinical nutrition manager and was promoted to director in 2015. And we are very glad to have you here. Thank you. Is that better? There you go. <laughs> um, tonight I wanted to start by saying I'm going to sort of follow up all that exercise information with good nutrition information to support that exercise as well as your day-to-day -day, um, challenges. I referenced the book Eat Well, Live Well with Spinal Cord Injury by Kylie James and Joanne Smith if you want, if you're looking for some further information on this topic. 
Uh, nutrition plays a vital role in supporting and keeping our bodies healthy, anybody's body, not just those with SCI, preventing and minimizing health complications and preventing nutrient deficiencies. Um, I share with my kids often, you only get one body and you gotta take care of it or it's not gonna take care of you. So I'm going to sort of give a good overview of keeping of that body that you have now healthy um, and sort of with the old adage in mind that we wanna prevent or be proactive in preventing some of the complications versus reacting to those complications. Specifically those with SCI, nutrition becomes even more vital because your bodies now have different needs and have increased risks because of that SCI. So nutrition can enhance the, oops, sorry, um, can enhance your natural healing potential. It can fulfill the higher need for specific nutrients. It can prevent secondary complications and it targets, like I said before, it targets the causes, not just the symptoms. And in addition, it helps maintain your weight. People with SCI experience an average, sorry, this is fuzzy, sounds fuzzy. Is that better? <laughs> um, people with SCI experience an average of seven health complications per year, and you can see them listed there. I'm going to focus on the, the, new, the foods where I'm going to focus on are going to specifically speak to bowel health, pressure sores, and UTIs. I'm going to focus on eight different items, different food items, macronutrients, um, that's going to support overall good health and help prevent these specific complications. So the first one is protein. Protein is essential for growth and repair of new tissues. And those with SCI have an 85 to 95% risk of developing some wound issues in in your lifetime and the typical needs for protein are two to three servings a day when you have if you're trying to heal some wounds that increases to four to five servings for, per day and you can see some of the sources some of the good sources listed on this slide the serving size is about the size of the palm of your hand and some vegetarian sources that aren't listed up there in case we have any vegetarians that are hummus nuts and nut butters, and tofu. Fruit. Um, probably the most important thing when you think of fruit is color, which may not may be something a little different than you're used to hearing about fruit. But fruit provides enzymes that help support that digestive function and help move things through the system. Um, it's high in fiber. And those different represent all different nutrients that help support that that digestive function. Grains, probably the most important thing to remember about grains is that you focus on whole grains, not refined grains. So whole grains are going to have higher fiber, higher protein, and they won't be stripped of all their nutrients, which is when we eat a refined grain, it's gonna be stripped of nutrients. Lentils and legumes. This is a dietitian favorite. <laughs> um, lentils and legumes are a great source of protein and carbohydrate. They are high in fiber. They absorb water, which helps bulk the stool and move it through the system. And um, the goal is typically, give or take, depending on the person, 30 grams a day, which, which is probably higher than most people are used to taking in. Vegetables go hand in hand with those fruits, and the most important thing to remember about vegetables, again, is color. Um, vegetables are going to be supportive of di your digestive enzymes, again, to, to support that bowel health. They're gonna provide m vitamins and minerals for the wound healing. They're gonna support your immune system. Um, and again, color, color, color. So you don't wanna just have yellow vegetables or just have green vegetables, a rainbow, of, of vegetables are, are going to provide a rainbow of vitamins and minerals to help support support you and support your immune system. The goal is five, I want to talk quickly about the, the goal of five or more servings a day. That sounds like a lot, but a serving is only um, a half a cup. 
So a half a cup is, is, is quite small. So if you have a, add a salad at lunch and dinner, you're probably covered. Bats, these are the, what once were thought the evil stepchild of, <laughs> of the nutrition world, but we know now that that's not, not the case. Um, health fat, healthy fats are very important um, for our overall health. It maintains skin integrity, softens stools, or lubricates the bowel, and the goal is to have at least two servings of healthy fat a day. And as you can see up there, I have things listed like olives, avocados, flaxseed. Those all are higher and have a good amount of good fat. You hear the terms good fats and bad fats. They have a good amount of good fats. One thing I didn't quite mention before I talk about fluids is these things I'm talking about are not just good for bowel health and prevention of UTIs and, and prevention of wounds, but also for cardiovascular health and diabetes and lots of other things that were on that list. I'm just kind of focusing on some of the heavy hitters. So fluids. I can't stress fluids enough. None of the things that I mentioned before, the fiber and the fruits and the vegetables is going to matter if you don't drink enough fluid because it's not going to, the, the fiber and all the vitamins and minerals need the fluid to do their job. So it's imperative for bowel function and the prevention of UTIs. It fl helps flush toxins out of the system. It helps your he heal, skin heal quickly. This um, The slide says six to eight cups. I would I would err on the higher side of eight cups, sometimes up to two liters a day. Um, water is best, but I know water can get boring. <laughs> so um, unsweetened teas, seltzer water, broth, soups. I threw um, cranberry and blueberry juice up there because that's very helpful specifically in the prevention of UTIs. And um, it helps balance the pH of, of the urine and the, the, the urinary tract. But when I talk about blueberry and cranberry juice, I'm talking about straight, unsweetened blueberry and cranberry juice, which is not delicious at all. <laughs> it's um, quite tart. So you would want to either dilute it with water or seltzer water, maybe squeeze some lemon or an orange in there, and, and that will be much more palatable. Um, I also have a couple recipes for some smoothie juice type drinks uh, to, that incorporate some of these things if you're interested. I tend to like to focus on the positive, but I did throw the one slide in here about avoiding things. Um, so it goes without saying that this picture with the donuts, those are things you don't want to have too often. <laughs> um, but basically, you want to avoid anything that is processed, basically. The less processed, the better. I know it's it's not always, we're not always, myself included, not always able to do it 100% of the time to avoid processed foods, but the less often you can do it, the better. Refined carbohydrates, it just, they just strip all the nutrients out. They add a few back in that the government said a long time ago we have to. Um, but you're not going to get any of the benefits of the vitamins and minerals, the fiber, probiotics, anything from, from um, processed foods. Um, trans fats. Avoid added sugar, soda. We want to avoid all those things. Trans fat is sort of a man-made fat that's not good for anybody. Um, and last but not least, in terms of the, the eight I wanted to discuss, are sort of extras. So you spices, there's a lot of good research coming out, and interesting research about spices. And it kind of follows the same mantra as fruits and vegetables. Think of those spices that are uh, dark and vibrant and colorful. So turmeric and cinnamon and cumin, they all have a, um, a vibrant color. That all rep they, Each one of those, again, represents some good either anti-inflammatory um, uh, properties or wound healing properties or antimicrobial properties. So it also goes, again, hand in hand with cardiovascular health. You want to use spices rather than salt to, to to jazz up your food. Um, so, you know, there's lots of benefits. Salsas, chutneys, vegetable relishes are another way to add extra fruits and vegetables and vitamins and minerals. Um, 
Daily vitamins. Probably a daily multivitamin is not a good is, is a good idea for pretty much anybody, just to make sure the bases are covered. If you're having issues with wound healing, vitamin C is a good one to add, zinc as well. Um, omega-3, there's some supplementation suggestions there, but again, those seeds, flax, chia seed, are all going to have good omega-3s. Uh, a probiotic is good for that bowel health, as well as yogurt. Um, and vitamin D is important for everybody, especially if you live in a, in a cold, not super sunny area. <laughs> and lastly, the, the take home message, it's, it's a few more than three, <laughs> but, um, one, it's not up there. We want to strive for weight maintenance. Initially after the injury, there's increased nutrition needs, um, for healing. But as we've learned pretty quickly, those needs drop pretty low. So, so we want to strive for weight maintenance, uh, focus on whole foods, focus on, a, focus on a variety of colors, avoid the processed food, a multivitamin daily, probiotic or yogurt daily, and fluids, fluids, fluids. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I'll let you step here. We'll have our, whoops, we'll keep our microphones away from each other. And we will have our final speaker, and then we'll be ready to take for the rest of the time questions and answers. And I'm sure speakers will be happy to talk with anyone after as well, if you're not the type that likes to talk in a group. Um, so our fourth is Dr. Stan Ducharme. He is a clinical psychologist and clinical professor of rehabilitation medicine and neurology at Boston University School of Medicine, as well as a diplomat in sex therapy, working with individuals and couples with disabilities on relationship and sexually related problems. He serves on the board of directors of the PVA Educational Foundation and is a member of the International Spinal Cord Society's Educational Committee and an all around great guy. <laughs> so we're really glad to have him here today. Thank you, Stan. Can you help me find my spot? Yeah, Let me just uh, start off by saying thank you for uh, the invitation to be here. I'm a sex therapist, as Beth Lynn mentioned, so uh, I know that talking about sex is a very personal and private kind of thing, and I'm going to try not to say anything that's too embarrassing or uh, too a little bit, nothing too far out there, but... Uh, when you talk about sex, it's hard not to say some things that some people might find uh, a little bit embarrassing. So just sort of uh, bear with me uh, as we go along. Let me just start off by saying that, uh, that sex uh, after a spinal cord injury is something that uh, most people with spinal cord injury feel is very important. Uh, there have been studies that have looked uh, sort of as to how much information is provided about sexuality during people's rehabilitation. There was a big study done in Europe with 350 people from uh, a number of European countries. And uh, as this slide mentioned, it was sort of seen as one of the most unmet uh, services, uh, areas of education that was not provided to people. Uh, in terms of its importance uh, for individuals with quadriplegia or tetraplegia, some studies have shown that next to arm movement and hand movement, the sexuality and, and having a good intimate life with a partner is sort of something that people valued as, as um, the next most important thing after uh, arm and uh, hand functioning. For people with paraplegia, uh, this study, which was in the Journal of Neurotrauma, uh, pointed out that uh, sexual functioning and a return to a good sexual functioning was really uh, seen as uh, the, one of the most important priorities over all other areas of functioning. So let me just sort of start off by saying that um, you're going to hear me talk today about that sort of coming to grips and, and sort of enhancing your sexuality after a spinal cord injury is a process, that it doesn't really just happen the first time you have sex after a spinal cord injury. Just like when we were teenagers, our first, our early sexual experiences for most of us were disasters. You know, maybe we were drinking, uh, for whatever reason, uh, we were anxious. They didn't turn out very well. And that's true with a spinal cord injury as well. It takes time. It's a process that needs to uh, uh, 
sort of uh, evolve over a period of time. There have been some studies that look about 65% of people with a spinal cord injury are sexually active within the first six months uh, after, the, after discharge. Another 28% um, are active in uh, the following six months. So in, the, in one year post-discharge after a spinal cord injury, about 93% of people with injuries are sexually active. But as this slide points out, there's a good number of people that feel that those early sexual experiences were really very unsatisfactory. Um, and again, as you're going to hear me talk about, part of the reason that these experiences uh, were less than satisfying is that people try to recreate the kind of sexual experiences uh, that they had prior to the injury. And, and that's very difficult, if not impossible, to do. So that, um, uh, again, most people sort of try to have, try to replicate the kind of experiences they had before. It's not a very positive experience. And for many people, they sort of then shy away and sort of uh, hibernate and are afraid to sort of put themselves out there uh, for additional kinds of experiences. For most people, sexual adjustment, even one year after injury, is something that has yet to be mastered. It takes a long period of time to get to know your body again, to get to know how things work again in a sexual kind of way. And for most people, that doesn't happen even in the first year. Most people in that first year, uh, they're dealing with uh, adjustment to the injury, they're dealing with all kinds of other issues, and sexuality is really just not something that they're really ready to address. Unfortunately, however, um, although it doesn't say it on this slide, is that most people, um, if they don't get the information about sex when they're in the rehab hospital, they don't ask people about sexuality after they're discharged. They, they are uncomfortable in talking with their doctors, seeing urologists, seeing a therapist, and then they, they sort of go without uh, really good, accurate information about how to enhance their sexuality after the injury. So, so for information about sex, there really is kind of a window of opportunity when people are in rehab centers that they need to sort of get that information. Unfortunately, as I said, they're really not ready yet at that time to address these kinds of issues. Sexual satisfaction after spinal cord injury. Sexual satisfaction after injury increases with time since injury. So that again, over a period of years uh, post-injury, people report more satisfaction. They report uh, more positive sexual kinds of experiences. That doesn't happen early on. Uh, it takes time to adapt to the new situation and to develop problem-focused coping strategies. Uh, for, a, for a spinal cord injury, obviously, it goes without saying that the individual must develop sort of coping strategies to sort of deal with the, all of the changes that, go, that have happened as a result of the injury. And that's true in the sexual area as well. It takes time to develop those kind of strategies to sort of feel good about uh, what's happening, to feel good about being able to sort of enjoy your body and giving pleasure to another person. It's a process that has to happen. People with depression and anxiety tend to be less satisfied with sexual activity. Yes, sexual function is really determined by sort of the neurogenic aspect of the injury, but depression and anxiety play a huge role. If you are depressed post-injury, if you're anxious, chances are you're isolating yourself, you're afraid to be with a possible sexual partner, you're not taking advantage of sexual opportunities that may come your way. Uh, you're shying away uh, from these kinds of opportunities that present themselves. So that again, uh, you're tending to hibernate yourself. You're not taking advantage and your sexual, your relationship. And when I talk about sex, I'm not just talking about sort of what happens in the bedroom, but I'm talking about sort of your interactions with potential sexual partners, whether that be, you know, somebody the opposite sex, somebody the same sex. Uh, those kinds of opportunities to be flirting, to sort of put that little sexual energy out there, th those are not happening if you're depressed, if you're anxious, if you're isolating yourself. The more time since injury, the less reports of erectile dysfunction. And this is all just reported 
uh, in spinal cord from the International Spinal Cord Society in November 2016. I'm not sure exactly why people over a period of time report less erectile dysfunction after the injury. Either they're getting some erections back or maybe uh, the erections are not, not as important as they were. But nevertheless, the data does suggest that the more time since injury, the less reports of erectile dysfunction. So I'm going to talk a little bit just briefly about uh, relationships, since sex, uh, for the most part, sometimes is part of a relationship. So to sexual adjustment uh, depends on a number of kind of relationship factors. The ability of the person to resolve the emotional issues of the spinal cord injury. I talked about that already. If you're depressed, if you're anxious, if you're suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder after the injury, you've got to resolve some of that kind of stuff before you can feel good about your body, before you can sort of begin to connect with other people. If you have a lot of psychological baggage that you're struggling with, that you're dealing with, th those kinds of issues are going to get in the way of you having a positive sexual experience uh, with a partner. The individual's ability to take emotional risk. You're going to hear me talk in the next few minutes about how important it is after a spinal cord injury. Just like I said before, if you're going to have a good sexual experience after a spinal cord injury, you're not going to be able to do the kind of things that you did before, probably. You're going to have to open up to a, a whole new repertoire of sexual behaviors. And that is a very risky thing for all of us to do, to do things that our partner might think is a little weird or kinky or we think is weird and kinky that we didn't feel comfortable doing before, but it gives us pleasure now. So it's a very risky thing to be able to communicate uh, about sort of what feels good, how, how we can give pleasure to the other person. We're, people with spinal cord injuries are very vulnerable anyway uh, in this kind of area. And to be able to put out there, this would feel good if you did this to me, or how does it feel when I do this to you? Those kinds of communi those, that kind of communication is really hard for all of us, regardless of whether we have a spinal cord injury or not. But when you have a spinal cord injury, it's really critical. You've got to be able to talk about that stuff. You've got to give feedback to your partner. Otherwise, they're, they're in the dark. They don't know. They, they're just sort of assuming what's, what's the best kind of thing. The extent that the individual can value new sexual behaviors and activities, I talked about that. The individual's ability to communicate, I talked about that. Successful resolution of any pre-injury sexual issues or sexual dysfunction. If somebody in that relationship was sexually abused, Obviously, that's going to have a factor. If somebody in that relationship is addicted to pornography and uh, they get their sexual needs from pornography rather than from a partner, that's going to impact uh, the sexual experience in that relationship. If that relationship uh, was, uh, if somebody has been having affairs in the relationship, if somebody is feeling uh, vulnerable in the relationship, that they're no longer attractive, that their partner is no longer interested, all those kinds of things. This has got to be resolved before. Sex doesn't just happen in a vacuum after the injury. Those kinds of things have to be resolved before you can have a good sexual experience. Other kinds of relationships, security in the relationship, you need to know my partner is going to stay with me. If, if our, if, um, I, I don't have to worry that if the sexual experience is not great, that my wife is going to sleep with somebody else or that she's not going to want to be with me, or that I'm not going to be able to satisfy her. Difficulty switching roles between care provider and, lo uh, and lover. I don't have to say too much about that. But that's a huge, huge thing. If somebody is providing care, kind of doing all these intimate things to their partner, and then sort of uh, a half an hour later trying to be a lover and a sexual partner. So those kinds of things need to be talked about, need to sort of be addressed in some kind of way. Understanding that sex may be different, I won't say too much more right now. Being supportive of each other when insecurities arise. Uh, uh, being willing to work together toward the goal of, uh, toward the goal of what? A positive sexual relationship. Both, it has to be important for both people. If it's just the person with a spinal cord injury that's interested in sex, and the partner is tired and fatigued and burnt out from all the care, that kind of lopsided relationship is not going to work. And again, understand that there are no failures with sex. I'm a sex therapist. 
when I see people with erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation, blah, 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 what I try to hammer home is, hey, it doesn't matter. There, there's no failures. Sex is about having fun. Sex is about connecting with a partner. If you have a partner, sex is about enjoying your body, enjoying your partner's body. And, and if that's really what it's all about, how can, that, how can you fail at that? You've got to just sort of let go of all these hang-ups in your head and just really be with your partner and have fun and enjoy the experience and, uh, and not worry about performance and whether you're pleasing somebody or not pleasing somebody or whether you have an erection or not. It really doesn't matter at all. And that's sort of the point that I try and drive home. So I won't sort of go through this. I think everybody knows this. About 75% of men with spinal cord injury have problems with erections, which means that um, um, you, most men need some kind. If you want to have an erection, which again, as I said, do you need an erection to have sex? Do you need an erection to get sexual pleasure? I don't know. Some people do. Our ego for guys says that, often says that we do. But if that's the case, and I encourage people when I see somebody in my office, I encourage them after a spinal cord injury, wait six months, wait a while, sort of see, wait, see how it goes. Just be in bed with your partner, touch them, caress them, hold them, kiss them, sort of start feeling comfortable again. Don't worry about having intercourse right away. And, that, and so I encourage people, yes, you may need Viagra, you may need Cialis, those are going to be helpful, but don't rush. You know, that can happen sort of down the road. But most men, if you want an erection after a spinal cord injury, you're going to need some kind of assistance. Approximately 20% of men with spinal cord injury are able to ejaculate, including retrograde ejaculation. So that's a big issue if you, uh, for people that want to have children. And about half of uh, people, men may experience some form of orgasm. So common problems for women after spinal cord injury, um, same kind of thing, that uh, uh, arousal may or may not be present. Uh, there may not be lubrication. Uh, uh, there may be um, some difficulties. They may need to use some water-soluble gel. They may have difficulties with orgasm. Although a lot of the recent studies and work that has been done that shows that women with spinal cord injury with more stimulation, if they're using a vibrator, if they're using sex toys, if the kind of the level of stimulation can increase, there's, there's a good chance that women, regardless of their level of spinal cord injury, can have an orgasm. So, so what do I do when, what do I encourage people to do? This is where it might sound a little weird. Um, I encourage people to, uh, if they have a spinal cord injury, I tell them, go home and masturbate every day. Um, explore how you can get erections. You've got to get, after a spinal cord injury, You've got to get to know your body and how it works again. You've got to get to know what turns you on. If you're a guy, you've got to get to know, how can I get an erection? How can I keep that erection? How can I get the most? Is there any areas that I can get pleasure? Uh, and the same thing with a woman. Uh, how can I um, sort of get sexual pleasure? You need to explore your body. And that's what I sort of encourage people to do. Uh, use sex toys. Uh, be touching their body, be masturbating when possible. Get to know your body so that you know how things work again. And the same thing in terms of sensations. Where can you feel? What pressure can you feel? Can you feel if your partner touches your penis uh, and puts a lot of pressure there? Can you feel if they touch your anus? Can you feel if they touch your perineum? Can you feel and get sexual pleasure if they touch that area, your nipples or that area where the sensation stops? You have to know that kind of information about your body after a spinal cord injury. And you've got to be able to communicate that to your partner uh, if you want to have a, a good, enjoyable sexual experience. They're not going to, they can't read your mind. They don't know that kind of stuff. So you've got to know what part of your body is going to give you the greatest sexual pleasure. And that might be your partner playing with your ear or playing with your neck or playing with your nipples or those kinds of things. It may have nothing to do with your genitals. But again, that's kind of all, you know, that doesn't quite fit the norm in terms of sort of the way we've been brought up. But it, it's important to, to know. So a few tips. Don't underestimate the importance of caressing, kissing, or, uh, or stimulating areas with sensation. As I said before, sex is more than just putting your penis inside the vagina. 
kissing, touching, all that stuff is as important. And most people with a spinal cord injury really value that, uh, those kinds of uh, uh, interactions, those kinds of physical things. Take your time. Don't rush it. If you are anxious, extend the foreplay. Don't rush it. You know, if a guy uh, may get some kind of erection during the foreplay, geez, our natural response is, geez, let me put that in the vagina before I lose it. Uh, take your time. There's no rush. Uh, enjoy the experience. Create a safe, non-judgmental non environment where you and your partner are comfortable, where you can talk, where there's nobody judging, there's no demands. Give positive feedback regarding your partner's body, attractiveness, and erotic qualities. People with a spinal cord injury, like all of us, don't always feel good about their body. Their bodies have gone through all kinds of change. They don't necessarily feel good about it, and they need positive feedback. Don't take, sec uh, don't take sexual difficulties as personal. If your partner doesn't feel like having sex tonight or can't get an erection, don't feel, oh, he's no, no longer attractive or she's no longer attractive to me. I'm, I'm not pleasing my partner. That's your, your mishigash. Uh, don't put sort of your issues on your partner. Be sensitive to the insecurities and help your partner feel secure in the relationship and maybe most importantly feel secure about themselves or herself. Let me just say, I'm going to go right to the last thing. A few final take-home take points that I've talked about before. Sex will be different after injury. Open your mind to new possibilities. Get away from the way sex was before. If you can do some of the kinds of things that you did before, more power to you. Chances are, though, um, you're going to have difficulties, you know, in terms of positioning, in terms of uh, your erections, in terms of lubrication, uh, all those type of things. Try, be creative. Get out of your head and stop thinking, uh, which is something that, you know, I tell everybody, regardless of whether they have a spinal cord injury or not. People get in their head with all this white noise, thinking, uh, my heart, am I soft, am I pleasing my partner? Uh, how's this going, blah, blah, blah. I say, get out of that. Get into your sexual fantasies. Get into things that turn you on. That's not going to get you aroused if you're in there worrying about uh, sort of uh, how your partner's reacting to you. When sex is stressful, people avoid it. So again, take the stress out of the sex. Enjoy it. Have fun. That's what it's supposed to be. Good sex, as I have tried to hammer on home, is good sex is a goal. It's not going to happen the first time or even early after injury. It's something you're going to work toward. It may take a year. It may take two years or longer. But be working toward it. And, and if that's something that is important to you, you can have a great sexual life after a spinal cord injury. It's up to you. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Um, so now we are going to take questions and answers. OK. Uh, I have two comments, or one is a question, one is a comment. Uh, first off, what do you do when STEM doesn't work? Uh, if you've got lower motor neuron damage like I do, you can put, send me to Sing Sing and I still won't move. Uh, you mean for erections? Oh, no. Oh, for that too, but uh, <laughs> actually I'm more Mar Marvin the Martian. Erections work, nothing else does. Uh, um. Well, yeah, I mean, the as I said, I think some people um, would benefit from the combined FES and, and upper body exercise. Of course, if you're not responsive to the STEM, you know, you, you can't necessarily do that form of exercise. But you could do just arm rowing ergometer on, on, the, on the rower. And, um, in fact, that engages a larger muscle mass than, for example, arm crank exercise, which is primarily the shoulder. So you're, you'd be working your back and, and larger muscle mass. So the key is work as much muscle as you've got, and um, work it pretty hard. And so, yeah, you're right. It's not the solution for everybody. We understand that. Um, but whatever you got, use it. And the other one is just I'm putting in a plug. Um, I'm part of an adaptive uh, rock climbing group that we climb every Sunday at the Brooklyn Bowlers in Somerville. And uh, if you're interested in Getting high in a way that the law has absolutely approved of for years, uh, you're welcome to come join us, and uh, we'll try to get pretty much anybody up the wall that uh, we can. Uh, if you can drive yourself up a wall, you don't have to let other people do it. <laughs> That's great. Any other questions? 
for um, same person. Um, you said exercising, you have to reach the intensity, um, uh, like for sweating, high intensity and everything. I mean, like, um, even before this happened, like, I would not walk really fast. I'd just walk, like, to walk. And, I mean, doesn't some exercise help? I mean, isn't exercise in itself beneficial, even though it doesn't cause one to break out in a sweat or be high intensity? Yeah, so certainly any level of exercise is going to provide some benefit. Um, the, the caveat being that there are thresholds to how much exercise is going to lead to long-term reduction in, say, cardiovascular risk or help to maintain exercise capacity. So um, when my wife says she's going to go out for a walk and get some exercise with her friend and, and, and talk, I, I tell her, well, you know, you're going out for a walk and, and a talk. You're not going out for exercise. Um, so, you, you know, in the, in the 150 minutes, just to sort of put that in context, um, you know, that's what's put out there. We know that people, that's a lot of exercise. That's, you know, five days a week, 30 minutes. That's really tough to get. Um, so what I would say is that um, even 10 minutes of very intense exercise is really worth a lot versus 30 minutes of very low level exercise. So if you could do, say, intervals, you know, go hard for a minute or two and then back off and hard for a minute or two, that sort of thing. Um, and you'll, you'll get benefit from that. Um, so yeah, any, any level of exercise is worthwhile. Um, so I, w I won't encourage you not to exercise because <laughs> it, it has to be very intense, but just realize that, that some intensity is, is, is really necessary and important. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Andy. I do have a question over here. Um, under nutrition, the, I understood that the best way to get the vitamins you were alluding to is in the foods themselves. Um, my sense is that vitamin bottled vitamins tend to be expensive. And um, you look at the label and you think, oh, this is great. And then you turn the bottle around and there's a disclaimer uh, saying this hasn't been reviewed by your mother or anyone else. And basically don't sue us. Uh, and the FDA hasn't looked at it and whatever. So, and you've just looked at 18 or $20 for a bottle at Costco to keep you going for six months or the rest of your life, depending on how old you are. Um, what, what's the drill with that? So the company line would be it's ideal to get all of your vitamins and minerals and nutrients, macro and micro, from food, from whole foods that are minimally processed, uh, prepared at home, using the preferred techniques of grilling and braising and, you know, not deep frying. Um, and that every day is a is a as a bounty of colorful vitamins and mineral. I mean, fruits and vegetables and lean proteins and and such. That being said, the reality is is that we don't necessarily live in that world, <laughs> and the goal is to strive towards that as often as possible, even if that's only one day a week, and. And, and then use those supplements to sort of fill in the spots is sort of how I think of it. Um, so there is some definitely some value to some of those supplementations because not everyone's going to be eating fatty fish three or four times a week and all of those seeds and nuts that have all those good healthy oils. So taking a, an omega-3 supplement is a, is a good idea to sort of fill in those gaps when you know, we're reaching for the cookies or the french fries or something like that. <laughs> so is this something like the exercise with 150 minutes that if you only do 110, that's better than doing... Exactly. <laughs> ...driving by the gym? Right. Okay. Some vegetable. that's what I always... It's one of my pet peeves when people say, oh, I'm not going to eat carrots or bananas because, you know, they've got too many carbs. It's like, it's a fruit, it's a vegetable. <laughs> I'd much rather you be eating carrots and corn and peas 
regardless of being higher in carbohydrates because they, they do have the fiber and the vitamins and minerals and, and, and not replacing them with a, with a processed food. So yes, some or as often or as frequent as you can incorporate those things, the better. All right, and if you do the number, the requisite number of, of uh, are they eight ounce glasses of water? Yeah, this you, is eight ounces. Okay, does your body squish after a while, or do you? <laughs> no, but you do have to pee a lot. <laughs> Until they are semi-permeable membranes, you know. This is for the uh, nutritionist again. Uh, just curious, um, what do you think of, um, I lost my, uh, coconut oil. So coconut oil is, get, has gotten some hot press lately. Um, it's, it's a mostly saturated fat. So it, it's not one that I would recommend using on a regular basis. If it's, if it's something you like and a flavor you like, it's, it's okay in small doses, but definitely the olive, avocado, canola oil, those are the better ones to be using and cooking with. The other question I had was, uh, what do you think about like almond milk as opposed to cow's milk? That's fine. If you like almond's milk better than cow's milk. Um, almond's milk, rice milk, soy milk tend to be fortified because mainly to make it nutriently more more sim the composition more similar to, to uh, cow's milk, but um, yeah, whatever kind of milk you like is okay. fine. Thank you. All right. Hi, uh, I just wanted uh, to ask a question of the, uh, or make a suggestion actually of uh, the first speaker. I'm 42 years post injury, and I was injured when I was in high school, 1974, and I was very fortunate to go on to Craig Hospital, where I received an incredible uh, spinal cord injury uh, education, not only myself, but my family. And being a teenager, you didn't want to hear about all of the things you needed to do. You just wanted to get back to being a uh, non-spinal cord injury. However, I did, and it's been very beneficial, 42 years post-injury. I've gained a little bit of weight over the past five years. However, one thing I did, I noticed that uh, you lack in your uh, presentation is that you don't mention range of motion for high, no, high spinal cord injury mostly focused on uh, paraplegic and those who uh, were capable of doing at any upper body function where they would be able to do the hand cycle, for example. So, uh, and then I think in some of your presentation, there were some generalities about uh, uh, high blood pressure versus low blood pressure, possible diabetes and that sort of thing. And I remember uh, my doctor at Craig Hospital was Dr. Robert Mentor, who Dr. Ducharme knows very well. And he wrote the first book ever published, uh, and author of the first book I ever published in 1982, 1992, on aging with spinal cord injury. And uh, that book still is like a benchmark for uh, a lot of what goes on with aging with spinal cord injury. And much of what was in there was that somebody has high blood pressure, develops that, or the, bad, the low and or the high cholesterol, the good and bad cholesterol. That could be, obviously, it's nutrition and so on and so forth. But a lot of that is genetic as well. Because what we learned uh, coming out of Craig Hospital is that as long as you continue to take the cholerogenic drugs and you continue to do all of the same things that you would do to maintain a healthy lifestyle, for example, not, not drinking excess alcohol, not smoking cigarettes, not doing uh, illicit drugs, and so on and so forth, just living a generally healthy, good lifestyle, then you would be aged the same in, in very similar ways as somebody who was able-bodied at your age. So I didn't see that in your uh, in your research there, and uh, I just want to just go back to say that the, the the continuous thing that we heard from coming out of Craig Hospital is that by uh, the physical therapist was that never under or overestimate the uh, benefits of range of motion. So I've been doing range of motion. I do it twice a day in the morning before I get out of bed, and then in the evening before I go back to bed. And I have excellent flexibility for 82 years post injury my upper and lower extremities, and my blood pressure, by the way. Just to give you an idea, it would be uh, around 110 over 65. And the HDLs and the LDLs are all in the limits that they have to be. And there's pre-diabetes that I have now. 
I get the blood, blood, blood work, uh, my full blood work up done every uh, twice a year and have been since 1990. But uh, that's only be partly because of aging. But uh, I've eliminated a lot of uh, foods that over the years you can oh, eat so many cakes and pies and cookies and candy, just cut that out. That just it makes common sense. I started doing that in my early 30s when there was no uh, thought of prediabetes or for myself anyway, uh, or weight gain and that sort of thing. Uh, no, I think that those are good points. <clears throat> you know, certainly um, I, I think maybe the, the take home message is that you have to be creative in how you're going to approach your health. Um, and, and it depends upon level of injury, uh, what you can and can't do. So, um, so w one interesting thing that's, that's come out recently is that um, some of the benefits of, of exercise might simply be raising your body temperature. So someone who, who can't do high intensity exercise may still um, get some benefits of, of an increase in body temperature that's like exercise. So there's work um, where they actually are, are having individuals basically sit in a hot tub a few times a week and they see um, benefits to the cardiovascular system. So the blood vessels become more pliant, uh, more elastic. Um, you know, the, there's benefits to the skin blood flow as well, things like that. And this is, you know, very recent work. But I think that speaks to the fact that, you know, uh, spinal cord injury, not, you know, everybody's the same. And so you're right. I, you know, there are some generalizations in what I put up there. Um, but certainly, um, you know, when it comes to exercise, if you can exercise, the more intense, the better. If you can't, uh, then we need to find other ways, you know, to try to get the benefits of exercise uh, to those. What do, you, what, what do you say then about the range of motion? Yeah, I'm not quite sure I know much about that. I mean, I guess, you know, any kind of movement is worthwhile and certainly, you know, would you know, have to prevent contractures and things like that. So certainly, uh, you know, that, that would be worthwhile. You know, it's, it's, you know, exercise has a certain profile, if you will. So like that increase in body temperature, things like that. So, so, and I can add to that too. So they're all, they're, they're both critically important. And um, so Andy's talk really focused on the impact of um, cardiovascular exercise from the standpoint of just overall health and prevention of, of various types of disease, obesity, cardiovascular, um, other cardiovascular comorbidities. But of course, range of motion is critically important as well. Um, and, and at the end of the day, um, the great point that you make is that you were empowered very early on to know what to do in order to move through life, you know, optimizing your health. And I think that's uh, incredibly important, and that's why we're all here tonight, right, is, to, is so that um, people are empowered with information. So thank you. Thank you. I would be able to take one more question. I want to recognize that we are over time and just really appreciate everyone's patience at the beginning. Um, so one thing I want to mention before we take the last question is that um, there are surveys that are being handed around and we really appreciate any feedback you might have based on your personal experience, people you know, um, about um, topics for tonight and, and also uh, topics, I'm sorry, for the future and then also what we've been talking about tonight because we really read those and use them to direct what we do um, in the future. We're going to be working on our plan for the next year. So it will really be helpful to us if you have a moment to do that. And I just want to mention that while we're taking our last question. Just a question about the accessibility of equipment at gyms. Um, I'm not familiar with all the details of the ADA, but uh, what are the limitations and what are the requirements for accessibility of gym equipment and shower facilities, et cetera, for people with uh, spinal cord injuries? So the ADA is really um, a couple of things about it. So um, the, the requirements of the ADA, we really consider it to be kind of the floor of expectations. Um, and it's things like being able to get in the door um, and that the locker room or restroom be um, accessible just as though, you know, the restrooms here are accessible, for example. Um, the ADA is not retroactive, so if there was a facility that was built before the law was passed, you're not legally required to go back and fix things, but if you build a new facility, then it has to comply, um, if that makes sense. So a lot of older facilities might not be ADA compliant or fully accessible. And then there's been increasing realization that the big gap is that the, the tenants of the ADA can get you in the door and enable you to use the restroom while you're there, but the ADA really doesn't say anything about the actual programming that occurs once you're there um, or what equipment they have. 
Um, the U.S. Access Board is an organization that's a, it's a group of people that are appointed by the federal government to create guidelines um, that are meant to kind of give teeth to the ADA. Uh, and they recently came out with uh, a, a little bit more information regarding access to fitness facilities. And it was, it was the basics. It was like making sure that there's adequate floor space between machines, for example, so that you can get to different pieces of equipment. But again, it really didn't talk about uh, programming or kind of what you do when you get in the door. So the ADA mo mostly talks about like physical access, but less so about um, uh, ensuring that you have something to do once you get there. And I think that's the, that's where we're really advocating for more work and more um, attention. This is going to end our lecture for this evening. If um, I just want to thank everybody for being here for our first Knowledge in Motion lecture of 2017 and for the webcasters for joining us. And um, so if anyone has further questions or things that you want to, uh, to mention or speak to this, I'm sure the speakers would be happy to talk with you individually as well. And you're also welcome to send them via email. Um, I do um, want to mention that if anyone is interested, um, Andy does have some open um, studies happening, um, and so he that involves the the um, FES um, stimulated um, uh, rowing and and hand cranks and anything else. That you want lots to of other stuff. Does that and lots of other stuff. He says so. If you are interested in any of that, um, then I'm sure that he would be happy to talk to you. Any of us could help get you that information. Um, so you're welcome to come to me to email us after um, whatever might work for you, and we're happy to help get you get in touch. So um, uh, let me see. And if um, if you need any help with your survey, there's the, all the volunteers are very happy to help you to fill it out, and they are happy to collect them from you. Um, and then I guess the last thing I'll say is that we are going to be having these Knowledge in Motion lectures quarterly. So we really look forward to having you for the next one next time around. And uh, we're just we're really excited to be uh, launching everything in 2017. And we hope it's a great year. Thank you, everybody, for being here.